Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are very pleased this evening to be able to welcome Dr. Nahavandian, uh, the Chief of Staff to President Rouhani uh, of Iran. Uh, can I just give you briefly the way the meeting is going to uh, proceed? Uh, after I give a very short introduction, uh, our guest will speak for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we will then be in conversation with each other for about five or six minutes, not for too long, and then the rest of the time available till 7 o'clock will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And I understand it's an on-the-record uh, occasion when you're, uh, that's what I understand you, you find acceptable. Uh, and uh, we hope it will be a very informal and a very helpful uh, occasion. Can I just very briefly uh, welcome our guest? Uh, he is, as I've said, the Chief of Staff to the uh, President. Uh, he is uh, one of the most experienced people in Iran with many, many years of, exp of uh, public service uh, in that country. Uh, he also knows the West very well. He lived in the United States, studied in the United States for many years. Uh, and uh, what we have seen uh, since President Rouhani came into office uh, is some of the aspirations you expressed at that time in an interview on BBC Newsnight. You said you hoped uh, that there would uh, be a process of... Uh, better relations with the West and with the international community. But you also asked people to bear in mind that the differences were quite deep, had lasted a long time, and therefore it would inevitably take time for these matters to proceed in a satisfactory way. Well, since then, of course, we've had the agreement on the uh, nuclear question, and we are all particularly interested in the outcome of the parliamentary elections in Iran, and uh, look forward to what you would like to share with us, both about the financial and investment uh, future for Iran, but also how the process of reform that the president has committed himself to, what we should expect, what is the way in which that is likely to develop both within Iran and with the wider international community. So with these few words, I now invite you to, to address us. Thank you very much. Do I get any credit for that prophecy or not? Well, it's, so far it's going according <laughs> to plan. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to be in this uh, uh, very important gathering uh, at a very important institute. Um, when I was thinking about uh, this meeting, I thought uh, instead of talking about day-to-day uh, uh, -day issues of our time, it is good to take this opportunity to go to some roots of the problems that we have around us. Um, 20 years ago, uh, when there was the hype of globalization in the air, everybody w was talking about globalization. There were some countries, some uh, nations who benefited from positive aspects of globalization. China, India, they were very successful uh, in utilizing global markets uh, and fight poverty. But there were negative aspects as well. Now, 20 years after, we see globalization of terrorism. Terrorists utilizing uh, globalization to spread terror and massacres around the world. And our region, the region I'm coming from, has suffered the most. That was mainly those who were uh, talking about globalization, making decisions about globalization. They did not take care of what was necessary for good governance of a global community. At that time, we had to put more emphasis on commonalities and cultural values, which is needed for a global life together, the values global governance, global ethics, common values between different, different religions. Globalization needs 
the kind of global tolerance, fighting the abuse of religion for violent intentions. And today we are facing this global terror. In fighting terrorism, we should not forget the roots, the roots of despair, dissatisfaction, and frustration. That's where the terrorist organizations are uh, getting all of their soldiers. Economic roots should not be forgotten. Now, we are facing this problem, this global problem. President Rouhani's uh, proposal to the world community two years ago in UN General Assembly to start wave war against violence and extremism was based on this understanding that terrorism is a global thing. Fighting terrorism has to be global as well. And what we are facing now in the Middle East, in Africa, even in Asia, and even in Europe, is terrorism and violence in the name of Islam. And unfortunately, Islamophobia is helping terrorist organizations to recruit young people, the young people who are coming from that culture and life condition of despair, dissatisfaction, and frustration. So these two go hand in hand. The abuse of religion and economic condition. In all of the countries that terrorists have been able to set a foot in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Just look at the median age. It's about 25 or even less. Unemployed young people. Those are the victims. What I want to take from all of this, there should be a strategy for WAVE, for world fight against violence and terrorism. And there are two main aspects in, on that which should not be forgotten. Cultural, global understanding for cultural fight against terrorism. And part of that is avoiding Islamophobia. It does not help when something happens at the hand of someone who claims to be Islam, Islamic. An organization, a murderous organization calling itself Islamic State. The Western media should not recognize this fabricated name, it's important. And should not be played in the hand of this kind of media play. And at the same time, do something about economic development. Iran is a good example. This does not come from nationalist uh, sentiment. It comes from the study of history. Iran has been pilot and forerunner in all of so socio-political movements in our region. Our constitution was the first. Our Islamic movement was the first. Our nationalization of oil was the first. 
Iran sets the example. When Islamic revolution uh, succeeded in Iran, the Western attitude towards this revolution was one of ignoring it or going against it. Instead of understanding it and coming up with some sort of relation, coping with it. After 37 years of this attitude, now the West is showing other examples of political Islam, which is not acceptable by any standards. Now, many have come to this understanding that the kind of Islam that Islamic revolution in Iran was presenting, the Islam of kindness, mercy, human rights, women's rights, this can be more acceptable. If you do not accept this version and you cannot stop, stop the whole Islamic movement, then you are doomed to face the versions that are not acceptable by any standards. And the last point is, again, along with that cultural correction of our assessment of Islamic movement, the economic relations between West and Islam has to improve. People have to see that through closer contacts and relations with West, development occurs. Mutual benefit is served. Instead of all of those ba bad memories of colonialism, that when Western companies come, they just take and go. There should be a new paradigm of cooperation. And new Iran is ready for that. After this nuclear deal, there is a real serious opening up in Iran for economic relations. And I'm here for this. To talk business, to talk economic relations. Instead of being pessimistic, instead of um, putting a lot of hurdles and obstacles, after this nuclear deal, we did make a deal. We did accept some limitations on nuclear. At the time that we made sure that our right to nuclear technology is recognized. But we did accept some limitations. But on the, on the other side, we wanted to have this lift of sanctions bring us tangible results. If that happens, it helps the process. If it does not happen, and tangible results does not follow, the damage will be out of any calculation. So let's make sure that this new opening, the, this new approach, bring us some results. And thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Navandian. Uh, can I just raise two questions with you before we move to questions from the, the audience? Much of what you said this evening in a very, very thoughtful uh, series of comments, you referred several times to the abuse of religion and you identified the Islamic State organization as responsible for that. And you said also uh, that there has to be uh, an improvement in the relations between the Western world and the Islamic world. Can I ask you whether you also accept there needs to be a substantial improvement in the relationships within the Islamic world between Sunni and Shia? Of course. Because what we have seen over the last few years uh, is a much worse relationship, uh, a much greater hostility, uh, sometimes physical hostility, 
of a kind far more serious than anything seen in the previous 50 years and perhaps a much longer period of time. And to be frank, it is often identified as part of what is seen as a, a, a competition between Iran and the Gulf Arab states for geopolitical preeminence. And Iran's allies tend to be those of a Shia background and the Gulf uh, Arab states of the Sunni background. And so the two have become mixed together. Is there anything Iran can do to try and reduce that tension and hostility and antagonism within the Islamic world, which would not only be important in itself, but might make a contribution to the peace of the region? I think uh, conflict of Shia and Sunni is a fabricated one. Shia and Sunni have lived together in Iran, inside Iran, for centuries. No problem whatsoever. After the Islamic Republic for the last 37 years, we haven't had any problem. The problem comes when the extremist um, thinking of Salafis are put in practice. The kind of thinking that you excommunicate everyone and anyone who is not like you. That is not Sunni. Salafi movement is against Sunni as well as against Shia. For them, whoever does not go with them uh, is kafir. And they, they just kill. You don't see this in any uh, school of thought being Hanbali or Hanafi or Shafi'i or Maliki or Shia. They have been living together. So it is not, uh, and this is very important that you raise this issue. This is not Shia against Sunni. And Iran does not have any problem with any Sunni country. We have one of the best uh, relations now with our neighboring countries. We have been, and uh, during the last two and a half years, uh, we have taken a lot of initiatives. Uh, but when it comes to Salafi thinking, which is unfortunately funded by uh, billions of dollars, then that creates, as far as South Africa, the kind of groups who are not accepting anyone else. That kind of thinking is not tolerable. That's not Sunni versus Shia, no. So we, we would do whatever it takes for, we call it taqrib, bringing together different schools of thought. Um, so you can be assured of any kind of effort that we can do on that. Thank you very much. Now, my other question is on a, a different aspect. Uh, when President Rouhani came to office, uh, he said, as we have both referred to, that he wanted to encourage a process of reform, of better relationships. And the inference was that that was both with the international community, but that it might have relevance also to the domestic situation within Iran itself. Now, recently, uh, his efforts were given a tremendous vote of confidence by the Iranian public in the recent elections, perhaps even more unexpected, uh, than, uh, much greater than had been expected even a few days beforehand. Do you see there is scope? Does the president see there is scope? And not simply to improve relations with the international community, but also to see a more open society within Iran, uh, a greater involvement of the Iranian people in the, their own government, in their own affairs, a, a more pluralist system, a more democratic system than you have achieved uh, so far. Do you see these elections uh, as being an endorsement that the Iranian public, perhaps the younger people particularly, who are a majority of the population, yearn for that kind of reform within Iran? What, how optimistic can people be in Iran that that is something that might actually now happen? Um, I think uh, we have been active in that front as well. At the same time that we were uh, having nuclear negotiations on the international frontier, inside Iran, uh, we have been accepting uh, all kinds of criticism. So freedom of expression that uh, you see uh, these, these times uh, against the government uh, <laughs> is not unpre it's unprecedented for. Uh, we have started from our, uh, ourselves. 
Uh, the media, you, you can see any criticism of the government of any sort, even it, it goes beyond any uh, toleration. And if, if that can be an indication on internet, on access to information, um, it is unfortunate that in the past, during the election, for some technical reasons, uh, uh, we had our internet cut, cut off. Not this time. Um, and the young people are usually uh, the happiest when, when they see that they are connected. And the, they really uh, express their joy and uh, uh, they were very pleased to see that they had their political uh, expression in uh, the uh, virtual in cyberspace. And this was for the first time that it was not the banners on the street which uh, uh, had a great influence. It was the cy cyberspace. So, uh, and again, on, for example, women's rights, you see the result that in the recent election, we have more women uh, in the parliament uh, compared to, to the last time. Uh, we think that we are um, advancing on uh, uh, citizens' rights in, in terms of, uh, in the t uh, terminology of President Rouhani. Uh, some work has been done and uh, that will continue. But of course, uh, the speed and pace uh, uh, is according to the conditions. Right, let us now move to, uh, could you please identify yourself and keep your question as brief as you can, because you can see a lot of people want to speak. Gentlemen at the back with spectacles, yes. Thank you. Uh, student of uh, War Studies at King's College London. Iran and Russia have recently engaged in military... I don't see you. Yes. Hi. Right yes. Here. Iran and Russia have recently engaged in military collaboration over a crisis in Syria. Mm -hmm. This collaboration has taken the form of uh, intelligence gathering and sharing, and recently <coughs> in the uh, form of a missile deal between Iran and Russia. How do you and how does the president envision this relationship between Tehran and Moscow developing as uh, things develop? Thank you. I think the common goal is fighting terrorism. Uh, and uh, also helping Syrian people to decide for themselves. Uh, the latest uh, uh, agreement on cessation of hostilities was something which was welcomed by us. Um, anything we can help for Syrians to start their Syrian-Syrian negotiation uh, would have uh, full support of us. Um, so uh, in, on those lines, yes, there has been cooperation. Uh, but uh, that cooperation is not limited uh, to one or two countries. Anyone uh, who wants to help this process get peace uh, and people's participation in uh, deciding on the destin destiny of uh, that country, uh, we should support. Thank you. Uh, yes. The late lady in third row. Oh, right. <laughs> To start off with. Okay. Uh, Lindsay Hills of Channel 4 News. Um, building on that, um, is there any, is, are there any, um, anything underway to improve relations with Saudi Arabia? And what exactly is the end state that Iran is looking for in Syria now? We don't have anything against uh, Saudi people or Saudi government. I think they have some miscalculations about some regional issues. When President Rouhani came to office, 
there were some kind messages uh, uh, sent back and forth. And we were ready, and we are still ready, to uh, talk over some of these issues and improve relations. But there come some uh, events and accidents which becomes very unpleasant and unacceptable to people when hundreds of people are being killed in uh, some, you call it accident, <coughs> in Hajj. And uh, you don't even hear any, not word of apology, at, at least a word of uh, uh, being sorry for what happened. People cannot accept this. When people hear some abuse uh, in the airport and they, they don't come with any kind of explanation between two uh, brotherly nations, this is not acceptable. Uh, nothing has uh, started from outside. Uh, if, if something happens uh, uh, by some uh, group of people which is condemned at all levels of the government and people have been taken to court and they will be punished, this is no excuse for uh, severing ties diplomatic ties. So everything has started from the other side. Our position has not changed. We want to have brotherly uh, relations. Uh, and we are ready to discuss uh, about the information and miscalculations of the other side. So from our side, we are ready. Gentleman just behind, yes. Uh, sir, James Robbins from the BBC. You said in your opening remarks that uh, flowing from the nuclear agreement, you needed to see economic results. Um, there have presumably been some positive economic results already uh, in the agreements you've signed, particularly in, in France in recent months. Uh, can you tell us what more you're looking for, what you'd hope to achieve, particularly with Britain, and can you tell us a bit about the discussions you're having with the British government during your time here in London uh, and the extent to which you think you've already met your objectives? Um, I think uh, I shouldn't say yeah, everybody has observed that uh, British companies have not been the first in the line. So um, I think time is of essence. Uh, those uh, who act uh, quick, they get the best results. And particularly, one area that uh, uh, British government and City of London, being the most important financial center in Europe, can do is on banking frontier. We need to see... Uh, facilitation of banking relations as soon as possible and as complete as possible. And London can do that. Uh, there was a commitment that US government as well as European governments took on themselves, and this is quote unquote, to take adequate administrative and regulatory measures to ensure clarity and effectiveness of lift of sanctions. This is in JCPOA. Do you see that kind of uh, insuring on banking issues? Not yet. Yes, there has been some uh, uh, work which has been done. The SWIFT is uh, in place with all of Iranian banks. Uh, there are some LCs being opened here and there. 
There are some, some correspondent uh, uh, relations with some banks, but not everywhere. The big banks are still worried about primary sanctions of the United States. I think they have to come with a very clear interpretation on drawing the line between primary sanctions and secondary sanctions. Non-US banks should not be limited in any kind of banking transactions with Iranian banks. That has to be delivered. And uh, Britain can do a lot on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, gentleman at the back. There's a microphone coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Good evening, Excellency. My name is Andreas Schweitzer. I invested in Iran in 2009. And I never left because I always looked at the glass as half full. How fast it will fill up is a different issue. <laughs> <laughs> but time, patience is a virtue. Now, what you said, we, take, we provide trade finance now also because this is indeed the most critical issue mm -hmm. as banks are not moving. The big banks, the Swiss banks, my home country, those who signed a deal with the Americans have also signed that they are not going to deal with Iran for two years. So all the big banks are not here. So we talk about a little economic war situation where Iran is really collaterally damaged because the Americans probably also don't want to be left behind. So my view is, as a businessman, to consider that sanctions are still in place. I think it is a much safer bet mentally to do so, at least until the next US government is in play in about a year from now. And I'm not sure it will be a smooth ride on all that. So having said that, and still remaining an optimist, I think if one has a, if one goes to mid-sized banks, and there was an article today in some of the papers where I think uh, Prime Minister Cameron addressed Barclays or someone, but if I were Barclays, I wouldn't move. There is nothing you can win compared to the potential you can lose of hundreds of millions of fines that have been paid. So to cut a long story short, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for SME companies and SME banks to, to do the trade. It is simply an issue to know the, the ground and to behave in a reasonable C could way. Could you bring your... Are you finished? Thank Yes, absolutely. So Thank you very much. all I'm saying is a word of encouragement. There are solutions, and let's not look at the huge banks. Let's look at the mid-size opportunities. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I think uh, that is a way forward, but we should not limit ourselves to that. Uh, small banks can pave the way, and they are, th there are some who are uh, working, actually. But uh, the solution is very easy. Some layers of comfort from OFAC to non-US banks can give relief to them and can encourage them to act. And uh, I uh, uh, admire Prime Minister Cameron's letter to Barclay. That was very encouraging. That sort of uh, demand should be in place uh, and OFAC and the US government uh, is responsible to give that kind of uh, comfort to non-US banks to engage. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Michel from Qatar. There's a microphone coming. Just in the second row here. Thank you. Thank you. Michel from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. If I understand you, uh, you speak a bit louder, please. Sorry. So if, I understand, if I understand you uh, correctly, you said that the Iranian model of Islam is the best in the region, and uh, no, I didn't say best. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thought it, uh, because I'm, I'm taking notes. You said it's an accepted form, and maybe the political Islam is not accepted uh, form of uh, governance, and we know that Turkey is a big Muslim nation, and they the ruling. Uh, a party adopting political Islam, and you have relationship with Hamas, who are, who are political Muslim. And I understand that Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and Qatar are a Sunni government, but I don't know what kind of Islam should I label it, but they are Sunni. So uh, do you think having that stance of that our model is the ideal is not good for Taqrib? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that uh, uh, Iranian Islam is the best. What I said was, historically, 
we have had these political uh, movements uh, before some other areas in the region. Uh, the problem in the West was not to try enough to understand the movements in Islamic uh, society in a timely manner. And always they have started with uh, the state of um, uh, rejection or refusal. Instead of that, I would encourage understanding. Uh, and the point was, instead of emphasizing on Shia against Sunni, which is not true, yes, we have had the Islamic movement in Turkey, we have had in Pakistan, we have had in Egypt. All of them should be recognized. And there is no antagonism between what has happened in Iran with what has happened in Egypt, for example, in the last 40 years. Why to fabricate this Shia versus Sunni thing? No. All of these movements can go hand in hand. What has caused problem? These terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, uh, Daesh now, what kind of ideology they, do they have? They are against Sunni as well as they are against Shia. We should not give them credit that they are Sunni. They are not. To me, they are murderers using the name of Islam just to justify what they do. So, if, if uh, I could not uh, uh, state myself well, no, uh, this does not come from a nationalistic sentiment. I think Islam, in all kinds, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam is the religion of mercy and kindness. And uh, uh, we, what we have learned from Islam is uh, to be patient and kind to others. We, we start Quran with Rahman and Rahim and end with Nas. And, and the middle word in the Quran is Wal Yatalattaf. So it comes from Lutf and mercy and kindness. Th this is what we have learned from Islam. And this new ideology of terror and violence is so uh, foreign to Islam that every Muslim should reject. Thank you. Uh, Yes. Second row in the middle here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Hussein, BBC. Following on from that, uh, because you spoke about uh, the roots between terrorism and economic despair, and you pointed to countries like Yemen. How would you say that the West should address the attraction of, of this kind of extremism within its own societies, particularly those who have not been economically deprived and who have had every opportunity here? I think that needs a lot of study. Uh, yes, I agree that some uh, have come from some well-off families. But uh, if you see the developments in uh, marginal parts of French society, for example, if you go back uh, to unrest that uh, Paris uh, experienced some years ago uh, and go to the, some suburbs of some big cities in Europe, in those immigrant or second generation immigrant societies, there you see also poverty. Uh, I, I'm not uh, claiming a overall and uh, exclusive analysis, but you cannot uh, go against this uh, uh, factor that poverty and the lack of economic development always has been a factor. Other factors can play. Thank you. Yes, gentlemen, front here. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Kim Sen Gupta from the Independent. 
I've just come back from covering the elections in Iran, and what was obvious was, was this need, this thirst for change. Now, you, you mentioned it's a matter of speed and pace, but do you think with the mandate that President Rouhani has now, if he doesn't move at some pace, uh, at some speed, that there may be a reaction? After all, you know, we had President Hatami, who was a reformist, followed by Mr. Ahmadinejad. So I'm just wondering, you know, um, how you see the, uh, the, the political shape emerging in, in Iran. I think uh, President Rouhani was successful in delivering what he promised on two priorities that he put for his first years of being in office. Number one, nuclear issue and lift of sanctions. Number two, bringing stability to economy. I think his record is uh, something to be proud of. And now he has time to uh, go to some other issues. If the pace and speed on these two issues was good, bringing inflation from 35% to 13% in two years uh, is unprecedented for. Uh, I think the pace will be proper when handling other issues. Uh, and uh, Iranians showed that they are patient enough and uh, pragmatic enough to see what choices are available and uh, make the best of it. So we'll work together. Right, now we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to take three short questions and then invite Dr. Nahavandian to, to respond. Yes, gentlemen over here. Middle row. Hi, it's Saad Khalid. Um, my question is about the um, oil prices and the oil output. So after the cancellation of today's meeting to agree to restrict oil output, do you think there's any possibility in, in the future for Iran to work towards restricting oil output? And do you think there's any benefit um, for Iran to actually benefit from the restricting of output in terms of attracting investment quicker? Okay, now second question, uh, gentleman in the middle here. Priyajit Dipsakar, author of Last Raja of West Pakistan. My question to you, sir, uh, with the regional context, how do you see uh, Chabahar in compared to Gawadar with economic uh, development? Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman at the back uh, for the final question. My question is about... Estate. Could you introduce yourself first, please? My name is Farrokh Negahdar from Iran. <coughs> My question is about a statement made by... Mr. Rouhani, two days ago, about the condition imposed on Mr. Khatami, previous president. As far as Mr. Rouhani told us, there is no sanction against Mr. Khatami in TV or any newspaper. But this order is still in place. And as far as I know, the Supreme Leader is silent about that matter. Who is behind this order? Are they the same people who oppose this uh, Iran deal or any other source of power still is there? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, if you go for more questions, my memory would not take you. <laughs> <laughs> First one was on oil. <laughs> um, of course, uh, the oil market... Uh, has to be managed more wisely. Uh, but for Iran to participate in that uh, uh, supply reduction, uh, the prerequisite is for Iran to come to the place that it had, the share market that it had, and then from that position help this uh, decrease in supply. And we have made the, that position clear. I think those who are responsible for this uh, uh, price shock, uh, 
they are responsible to do something. And uh, they will do, because uh, now the world economy is suffering from what happened. Uh, and uh, Iran is uh, in a position that our reliance on oil money has become the minimum compared to everybody. And those who are responsible for this pr uh, price shock, now uh, they, they are running a budget deficit, almost 23% of their GDP. So they are forced to do something. On uh, Chabahar and Quatar, uh, I think development everywhere is something to be welcomed. And uh, we even have uh, thought about some cooperation and some line of transportation between uh, Chabahar and Quatar. Uh, we, we have no problem with uh, development there. And uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, potential in both countries in that re region to be developed. Uh, and uh, we will certainly uh, continue with uh, much more uh, financing support for development of Chabahar. And we already have a lot of interest being shown with uh, foreign investors uh, to connect Chabahar to uh, Central uh, Asian countries. And the third uh, question, uh, that is uh, some ongoing issue. Um, there has been uh, some uh, misunderstanding uh, in some parts of uh, responsible organizations. Uh, what uh, President Rouhani expressed on that, that is the uh, government's position. And uh, steps uh, will be taken to uh, correct those misunderstandings. Dr. Nahavandin, we know that you have yet another meeting to go to uh, from, from here. And we are grateful to you for your time that you have spent with us. Uh, you have given some very thoughtful responses to the very wide spectrum of questions that have been put to you. When I introduced you earlier this evening, uh, I quoted your remarks at, at, when President Rouhani came to office, when you not only mentioned that he was keen to make uh, progress, but added the caveat that that will take time, given the depth of the problems with the West uh, that have existed for many years. And I think perhaps what is now being experienced is that that delay, that slow progress, is on both sides of the equation. And Iran itself it may be a bit frustrated at the slowness of the improvement in relations in regard to banks and other financial institutions. But then, of course, there's a long history of non-cooperation that now is having to be reconsidered in the light of the progress has been made. If I may suggest that uh, I think for a good number of years, perhaps on both sides of the equation, uh, people were looking for problems, and when you look for problems, you find problems. What has changed is that people are now looking for solutions. Yes. And although it's taking time, at least the move is in perhaps the right direction. Can I simply, uh, on behalf of us all, thank you for, for sharing some of your time with us, for giving these uh, interesting, very perceptive responses to the questions that have been asked, and wish you well in the efforts uh, ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.